Sorry for the delay. We've had some technical difficulties. Today we have a special guest, Ka Irina, um, and she will be telling us more about this day today. It's um, the Liberation Day or also called Victory Day. Um, hello, Irina. Hello. Uh, How yeah. are you? Uh, I'm fine. Thank you. Um, so you're celebrating today maybe you can um tell us a bit more about this day um yes for all people from former soviet union like myself and well beyond uh, that um it's it is a big day um since our since my childhood for example i remember uh first um, conscious big celebration in my life of of this day was in 1975 it was um, we were celebrating 30 years of the Victory Day. Uh, it is such a big event uh, for us because it has affected uh, virtually every family in our country. But also, of course, uh, um, uh, our victory uh, has a significance for the whole world. 
um, we call uh, that part of the Second World War uh, from the 22nd of June 1941 until uh, May 1945, we call it Great Patriotic War. It is a part of the Second World War, but this, it is this part when uh, the war became just because uh, it was a confrontation of two systems, you know, capitalist system and socialist system. And socialist system uh, has shown its strength, its vitality, and uh, uh, um, when we were studying history of the Second World War in Soviet Union, uh, we were always uh, thought that um, one of the main um, results of this war was uh, um, the strength of the socialist system became obvious to the whole world. Nowadays, now they're trying to rewrite history books in Russia, so they try to play it down. They say people would have won without leadership of the Communist Party, without Stalin and so on and so forth. But if we look really at the history, we can see that this is not true. Um, until uh, now, it, it's still a most significant event in the history of our country, as some people say, and uh, even in the capitalist Russia, you know, they're celebrating it, although they're trying to give it a different tone. The victory of Soviet Union over Nazi Germany had a huge impact on the post-war development of the whole mankind, and it was truly of world historical significance. During this war, uh, our people were protecting not just uh, dignity and sovereignty of our multinational Soviet Union, but also uh, the whole world was spared from the threat of fascist enslavement. Uh, the Soviet Union has, the uh, Soviet people have not forgotten the contribution of other members of anti-Hitler coalition made to the victory. But the historical truth is that it was the Soviet people and the Red Army that blocked the path of fascism to world domination, uh, experienced the brunt of the war and made the most serious contribution to the defeat of Nazi Germany. Uh, when our country was attacked, uh, the enemy counted on inciting ethnic strife on the collapse of multi-ethnic socialist state. But they miscalculated, and all the peoples of the Soviet Union fought heroically, shoulder to shoulder, at the front, and they worked selflessly for the sake of common fatherland and the victory of, of, uh, over our enemy. In this uh, war, our great patriotic war, uh, the Soviet people not only protected the integrity and independence of our own country, but also fulfilled their liberation mission and saved the peoples of many other countries from fascism. The Red Army in total liberated 13 countries in Europe and Asia with a population of about 150 million people. A striking manifestation of Soviet patriotism was the mass partisan struggle in the territories that were occupied by uh, the enemy. Hundreds of thousands of Soviet people who remained behind the fascist lines took up arms and fought the invaders, sparing ne uh, neither their strength nor their lives. Uh, the extensive system of patriotic and labor education that was created in Soviet Union before the war, uh, during the socialist period, you know, under leadership of Stalin and the Communist Party, prepared especially young people uh, for this uh, horrible war and they led to the formation of a generation of patriots of all nationalities who were ready to do anything for the sake of their motherland. From the first days of the war, the all union Leninist uh, communist youth, uh, Komsomol, under the leadership of the Communist Party, was engaged in mobilizing young people to resolutely repeal the enemy and defend the motherland. 90% of the Komsomol members in Leningrad city, 80% of Komsomol members in Moscow, and over 75% in Stalingrad fought at the front. During the war, uh, three and a half million Komsomol members joined the army and the navy and partisan detachment in Soviet Union consisted for 60% uh, from young people. Millions of young men and women also work selflessly to fulfill orders for the front at the factories, on transport, in collective farms and state farms, in various uh, scientific laboratories. All these heroic activities of the Soviet people in the rear and at the front line were directed by the Communist Party, by its central committee, by local party organizations. The best forces of the party were thrown to the front line from the very first days. Uh, at the beginning of the war, about 17% of the country's communists were in the military party organizations, and by 1943, it became 55%. In total, from uh, July 1941 to July 1945, uh, almost 4 million party candidates uh, became uh, party members. And during the war, the party organizations of the army increased 
five times and uh, uh, in the Navy three times. At the battlefields at the time when it was partic particularly difficult, there was often a call, uh, people are saying communists go forward. So communists were uh, always at the front line showing the examples, uh, or the, the example of heroic spirit to the rest of the soldiers. Uh, this great patriotic war was a great test, greatest test for our people, and it has shown with extraordinary force that it's the masses of the people who are the decisive force of history. Uh, the victory of the Soviet people in the great patriotic war came at a very high price. The Soviet Union in 1941 to 1945 lost a large number of personnel of the army and navy, civilians, weapons, military equipment. The Nazis looted and destroyed a large number of monuments of culture and art, destroyed and burned many cities and towns. Huge damage was caused by the German occupiers to the national economy of USSR. Uh, they have barbarously destroyed uh, 1,710 cities, 70,000 villages, and they uh, also have blown up and destroyed about 32,000 industrial enterprises. Uh, this war became a serious test of the economic and organizational capabilities of the Soviet state. In the most difficult situation, in a few months, more than uh, almost 2,000 large enterprises, dozens of universities, institutions, and significant material resources were evacuated from the Western regions to the east of the country. And a year after the start of the war, uh, in the Ural Mountains, in Siberia, and Central Asia, more than three quarters of the military products were produced there already. So they literally moved the whole factories uh, to that part of the country. The effectiveness of the military economy of USSR is evidenced by the fact that uh, even in 1942, uh, our country had much less economic potential than Germany and all the occupied countries of Europe. It produced almost twice as much military equipment. Uh, the talent and labor of our scientists, our designers, engineers, workers created new types of aircraft, tanks, guns, mortars, and other weapons that surpassed the enemy's weapons and their characteristics. In cities such as in besieged Leningrad and fight in Stalingrad, work in the workshops that produced military products was not interrupted, even when the enemy was literally at the factory walls. The workers in the countryside also, despite the fact that the main granaries of the country were captured by the enemy, uh, and despite the fact that they didn't have enough uh, people and equipment, they still managed to provide the front and rear with enough food and the industry with raw materials. Uh, more than 74% of total losses of the German army uh, that the German army suffered were uh, in the battles with the Red Army. Soviet troops in 1941 to 1945 defeated and captured 607 enemy divisions, while the Anglo-Americans only about 175, 176 divisions. The loss of German fascist troops on the Soviet German front, only in terms of personnel, was four times greater than in the combined Western European and Mediterranean theaters of war. And in terms of number of killed and wounded, uh, it was six times greater. On this front of the Second World War, the main part of the aggressor's military equipment was destroyed, about 50,000 tanks and assault guns. Can I continue? No. Uh, about 75% of total losses, more than 70,000 aircraft, that's about 70% of all German aircraft, and uh, 167,000 artillery pieces, or so 74% of the total losses. For Soviet Union, of course, the most uh, severe consequence of this aggression were the human losses. Uh, they were amounting at a total of 20, almost 27 million people. This figure was obtained as a result of extensive statistical research and uh, subsequent work uh, uh, of the State Commission to clarify human losses. Now, 75 years after the end of the war, there is a clear tendency in certain circles to re-examine the history of the war and to even to falsify its main events. In the number of works and statements of individual politicians, the causes and nature of the war uh, have been uh, shamelessly distorted. Attempts have been made to belittle the significance of the struggle of, of the Soviet uh, army and to exaggerate the contribution of American British armies in the defeat of Germany, and at the same time to denigrate the great uh, feat of the Soviet soldiers. That is why the problem of further study of the history of the war, reflecting its actual place in history and increasing the effectiveness of propaganda of the events of the war uh, continues to be relevant. 
Uh, we must also uh, remember that this war occupies special place not just in history of our state. It was unprecedented test of all the material and spiritual forces uh, of our country. And the main strategic result of the struggle uh, on the Soviet uh, German front was the collapse of the military power of fascist bloc, which led to the collapse of the entire political and military system of Hitler in Germany and its European allies and the complete failure of their strategic plans. Uh, as we know, as a result uh, of the Second World War, uh, uh, a block of uh, socialist countries were formed. First, they were, uh, they were uh, national uh, people's democracy countries, and then they became socialist. There was also a great push for decolonization because the results of the war were a great inspiration for people in colonial countries. So that was the beginning of the decolonization process. And also even Western countries, not many people there think about it now, maybe not many people realize it, but the welfare reforms were also forced after the Second World War by the popularity of Soviet Union and socialist idea. For example, I'll just give you one example. In Britain, the uh, National Health Service was introduced, which still exists today, uh, which provides uh, well, all the main treatments are free of charge, even though now it's been privatized, and, but this was the result of the Second World War. And of course, uh, also um, emotional uh, aspect is very important. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, socialism suffered temporary defeat in our countries, and, and but our heroes of the war, they are still huge inspiration for us today. So, you know, when we uh, when we feel um, when we become depressed, when we feel down, we always remember about how hard they fought and they never gave up and they they never allow themselves to you know to be depressed. And we have to look at them as an inspiration for our future struggle for the restoration of socialism. That, that's it. Thank you so much, Kairina. Um, so just um, a quick follow up. Um, you were talking about the revisionism going on, the exaggeration of the, um, the involvement um, of the allies in the defeat of Nazi Germany. Um, is that also the reason why in some countries in the West you, um, they celebrate, uh, they celebrated yesterday, not today? Um, uh, that's part of it. Even though historically uh, the peace uh, was, uh, the capitulation of Germany was, uh, uh, how you say, the war concluded on the 8th, but we always celebrated on the 9th. You know, but uh, we uh, feel now every every year we can see more and more that they're trying to um, minimize the role of the Soviet Union in the victory. So the, uh, mm -hmm. if you look at the Hollywood films, if you look at the way news is being portrayed, you know, it's an obvious trend. But I must say that it's Russian authorities' own fault because they are trying to rewrite our own history inside the country also. Uh, they try to um, minimize the effect, uh, how you say, you know, before the Second World War, uh, we had the industrialization of the country, then collectivization of the agriculture, and uh, we also had the Cultural Revolution. Without all of this, the victory wouldn't have been possible. And when the authorities start rewriting our own socialist history, you know, inside the country, they cannot expect that, uh, uh, you know, imperialists from other countries will not take up this trend and use it, you know, against... Uh, against the uh, historic memory of our whole victory in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is there any special things you do to celebrate, like a tradition or anything today? Um, um, in the last few years now, they introduced uh, something that got initiated. It started as a people's initiative, and then the, the officials took it over. But People used to march in the streets with portraits of their family members who uh, were killed during the war or who mm -hmm. took part in the war. Well, I mean, it's not really kind of possible to do today because of lockdown and so on, but I still have my uh, grandfather's picture and both my grandfathers. One of them was fighting under Leningrad, you know, when Leningrad was besieged and the other one was killed in Poland in 1944. So, uh, Usually, it's a day we also visit our family's graves. Again, it's not possible mm -hmm. because of the lockdown. Yes. But usually, we just come together as a family and then uh, we sing um, uh, wartime songs and uh, we have a, a little meal together. And then in the evening, we used to go out and watch uh, fireworks. Again, today you can only watch it on TV. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, but there will still be fireworks. There will be still fireworks, but from all the former um, socialist republics of the USSR, only one uh, military parade was held today. It was held in Belarus in Minsk. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, is there um, anything you would like to add? Or we also have Tito Joe here, if you would like to say anything. Um, to the significance of this day. Otherwise, we would uh, yes, um, go on. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to, to hear uh, what uh, what Kajum has to say about the war, the significance of. I mean, if he can say a few words, that would be great. Oh, good. <laughs> um, can you tell us a sh in short, uh, like a few short words about the significance of May 9? Maybe you have some um, opinion on this? Or... My opinion, about May 9. About May 9. Uh, of course, uh, the victory of uh, the Soviet Union uh, together with the Allies uh, in uh, defeating Nazi Germany uh, is of great historical significance. Um, the people of Europe and the rest of the world um, were able to free themselves from um, fascism, um, even as far as in Asia, the allies of uh, uh, Germany was also defeated uh, with China, with the Chinese revolutionary forces playing the key role. But uh, on a world scale, it's recognized that the Soviet Union was the one that delivered uh, the death blow to Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, the German fascists invaded the Soviet Union, but uh, eventually um, the uh, tide of the war was reversed against them at Stalingrad. And then the, the great counteroffensive was undertaken. And it was due to the Soviet counteroffensive that Nazi Germany would be defeated. I, the, uh, uh, the, the Allies just uh, were secondary. Now they're trying to, uh, you know, minimize the role of the Soviet Union and even uh, uh, make lies against the Soviet Union and uh, uh, against the leadership of Stalin. But uh, it's a matter of uh, fact that cannot be denied that the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Stalin, uh, was able to uh, deliver the main blow uh, and uh, uh, cause the defeat of uh, Nazi Germany. So we owe um, uh, freedom that ensued from that victory uh, to uh, the Soviet Union. And it was a manifestation of the strength of a socialist country against an extreme force of capitalism uh, in the form of fascism. So it's still significant to us. Um, right now, uh, we are faced with the renewed threat of fascism because of the uh, crisis and desperation of the world capitalist system, which has uh, um, made um, it the crisis far worse than ever before uh, with its uh, uh, adoption and implementation of the neoliberal economic policy. And um, uh, as, uh, uh, as Marx pointed out, capitalism brings about its own, its own um, uh, instability and uh, um, uh, self-destruction uh, through the crisis of overproduction and, of course, the abuse of finance capital 
And uh, we are uh, witnessing today intensified inter-imperialist contradictions. And um, in every capitalist society, as well in uh, other time, other types of societies ruled by the bourgeoisie, as in the Philippines and elsewhere, uh, the bourgeoisie is so desperate that uh, um, repressive measures and fascist movements are encouraged by the ruling class. At the same time, uh, the very suffering that the people uh, undergo uh, drives them to resist. And so we have anti-fascist movements all over the world. So and, uh, it is uh, worth remembering and celebrating the victory of the Soviet Union and uh, uh, the peoples of the world uh, against uh, the fascist powers, uh, the Axis powers, in which uh, um, Germany, Italy, uh, and Japan were the uh, uh, main uh, powers. So I think <laughs> uh, that is okay. enough for me to say. Uh, All right. Um, I would like to greet uh, Irina. I'm happy to be in the same program. I'm also with her. very happy to be in and the same course, program I, with you. <laughs> of course, I, I'm happy to have uh, Edna as the host for the two of us. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's great. Well, thank you so much. Um, Kairina, I hope you have um, good celebrations despite this quarantine. I'll probably phone my mother, you know, that's what they're going to do. And then maybe we'll sing over the phone or something like that. <laughs> that's also nice. Um, well, if that is all, then we would um, have a short break again. And then we'll be back with our Lenin serie. And today we are talking about what is to be done with Tito Jo. Mm -hmm. Знамен разгромленных гитлеровских армий, склонены к ногам победителей. Трибуны заполняются гостями, депутатами Верховного Совета СССР, участниками юбилейных торжеств Академии наук, генералами, 
Героями Советского Союза, мастерами искусства и литературы, стахановцами московских фабрик и заводов. Девять часов пятьдесят пять минут утра. На трибуне мавзолея товарищ Сталин, руководители партии и правительства Советского Союза. Парадом маршал Советского Союза Рокоссовской. Парад принимает маршал Советского Союза Жуков. маршал Советского Союза Жуков обратился с речью к войскам Красной Армии, к рабочим, колхозникам, к интеллигенции, ко всем трудящимся Советского Союза. «Отечественная война завершена», — сказал маршал Жуков. «Над фашистской Германией одержана победа, какой еще не знала история. Мы победили потому, что нас вел к победе наш великий вождь и гениальный полководец, маршал Советского Союза, Сталин. everyone we're back from the short break um so and we are continuing with our lenin serie today is the culmination of this series um as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of liberation day um the day the red army liberated um liberated the people from nazi germany um and today for our last episode we will be talking to Tito Jo about what is to be done by Lenin um arguably his most famous work i suppose um yes so Tito Jo can you give us a, the historical context that led Lenin to write the pamphlet what is to be done um what was its significance then 
Well, the uh, What is to be done was written by Lenin in 1903. That was only two, two years before the Russian Revolution of uh, 1905. Uh, we could say that uh, Russia was in ferment, big ferment, no? And uh, this is the result of the complexity of uh, Russian society. You see, um, Russia uh, was, in a sense, uh, an ocean of uh, medievalism and feudalism. At the same time, the industrial bourgeoisie had already established uh, uh, enclaves in Petrograd and Mexico, and um, it had an oil field no, in Baku. So uh, this is a kind of society quite different from the um, so the uh, comprador bourgeois rule society like the Philipp like that in the Philippines, uh, there was an industrial bourgeoisie and Lenin had already studied the development of capitalism in Russia. At the same time, Lenin would uh, describe um, uh, Russian imperialism as uh, a um, military feudal type of imperialism. That's because of uh, uh, the long background of Tsarist uh, 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 grants of land to military officers as well as bureaucrats as rewards you know, for service to the uh, um, to the Tsarist rule. Um, so you have uh, in the development of industrial capitalism on top of a huge amount of uh, feudalism. And uh, in this kind of situation, um, there was uh, um, the sharp contradictions between uh, the Russian people and uh, the Tsarist uh, uh, rule. At the same time, there was a competition for leadership um, between the bourgeoisie, uh, particularly the liberal bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And uh, uh, Sarism um, uh, seemed to wish that the liberal bourgeois uh, could become its instrument. So there were, you know, there were uh, the constitutional Democrats proposing, you know, the uh, monarchy uh, to become a uh, constitutional type, as in the example of uh, uh, England. No? Then on the side of uh, the proletariat, uh, there had already been the League for the Emancipation of the Working Class. And, uh, you know, Lenin, Plekhanov, and others were in this League. And um, so, but uh, this organization of the workers was quite loose. People can move in and out, no? Nothing definite. At the same time, Martov in 1903 proposed. Uh, that um, the party of the proletariat uh, would be constituted by uh, trade unions. Lenin said, no, if you will limit, uh, you know, the membership to trade unions, then uh, you are confined in the trade union struggle. Uh, the trade union struggle is good, important, but uh, the rev those revolutionaries who wish to attain socialism, uh, should not be limited because you can limit yourself to trade union struggle, then you are confined to asking for reforms uh, from uh, the bourgeoisie or from even the uh, Zarish rule. And there were also the so-called economists. They wanted to uh, confine the struggle to economic struggle. Eh? Re political revolutionary struggle is something to be avoided, postponed, or uh, First, the economic struggle. So they were advocating economism. So uh, this is the brilliant idea of Lenin. Um, let's make a party uh, that uh, consists of uh, uh, individuals. They join up and uh, they f they form the the vanguard um, uh, party of the proletariat. It was not due to have uh, uh, simply representatives of the trade unions coming together, but there must be a party uh, with individuals 
who uh, become educated in Marxism, um, become trained uh, in the struggle, and who are disciplined under the principle of democratic centralism. Uh, so uh, they are the reliable professional revolutionaries. And uh, you cannot get this kind of party by, by automatically by putting together the, the, the trade unions. Otherwise, you will have something like the British Labour Party or, you know, or the social democratic parties in the Western Europe, no? So um, Lenin had that point. Uh, so he was able to uh, uh, show the need for a revolutionary party of the proletariat uh, that is ideologically, politically, and organizationally prepared uh, to a struggle for uh, good immediate uh, um, demands, but uh, it must uh, aim for socialism. Uh, so that's the uh, big thing, the great thing that Lenin did in what is to be done by insisting that the, proletari the revolutionary party of the proletariat must arise, uh, take the standpoint of looking at the entire society, and in a sense, uh, it, uh, uh, it comes from the outside, no? It comes from the outside, but it goes in to the ranks of the workers, into the unions, and into the mass movement of the workers. So um, when the term uh, from the outside was used, it was only meant uh, to stress the point that it does not automatically arise eh, from the trade unions and from trade uh, unions, uh, from the trade union struggle. You know, if you are well acquainted with the lives of the exploited people, uh, the workers and peasants. Uh, they are so preoccupied uh, with earning a living under conditions of oppression and exploitation. So um, you must have professional revolutionaries who can look over the entire society, take the side eh, of the workers, and uh, uh, make sure that there is a consistent, resolute, and militant party to fight for the interest of the workers, but you must engage the, to win victory, you must engage uh, the workers. It, the, the proletarian party must be the party of uh, the workers. And if you do your work well for a long time, the majority of members would be workers. So um, is that also what you think is um, significant for the present context? Is well, uh, uh, the teachings of Lenin about party building um, are important today. We are faced with conditions resulting from extreme policies of oppression and exploitation, uh, especially under the auspices of uh, uh, neoliberalism. You know, under neoliberalism, neoliberalism is even against classic, uh, classic uh, liberalism. At least from Adam Smith, you get the recognition of the workers. Uh, you, you get the recognition that the workers uh, provide the labor and it is the source of wealth. No? Um, the workers create uh, material values. The capitalist class uh, uh, takes away what is called the surplus value and what is left is only, you know, uh, the uh, uh, the wages. Uh, in uh, Under neoliberalism, uh, there is the notion, a very anti-social one, an anti-labor one. Uh, the bourgeoisie is the creator of wealth. And uh, uh, so the, the workers uh, uh, depend on uh, the bourgeoisie. And uh, in order supposedly to keep the economy growing, the GDP growing, uh, the um, bourgeoisie, the monopoly bourgeoisie, must have all the chances of accumulating capital. It can draw more profits by decreasing the wages. It is. Uh, it gets tax exemptions. Um, even the workers are deprived of uh, what you might call indirect wages in the form of social services. So there is a shrinkage of uh, social services. And then, um, and uh, 
any public asset that is profitable is to be privatized. And so, <laughs> and then trade and investments are favored by the state. It's the state being used by the bourgeoisie at the expense of the proletariat and the, uh, the people. And in the case of the people outside of capitalist, the industrial capitalist countries, their economies are subjected more to uh, denationalization. You know, they, they lose the rights of uh, sovereignty and uh, national patrimony over their own resources. So that's how bad neoliberalism uh, is. And this has been going on for, uh, for decades. And uh, right now the uh, monopoly bourgeoisie or the imperialists are reaping, are reaping uh, what they have uh, sown. No? And uh, there is now a big uh, whirlwind of protests, no? interrupted momentarily by the, by the lockdowns <laughs> because of COVID. But you know, in, in last year, and um, this year, uh, you see, you know, big mass movements arising. So, um, and you know, but uh, you know, in this long period, when the, um, uh, the socialist movement and the working class movement took some uh, took some major defeats, no, because of the uh, revisionist betrayal of socialism in big countries like. Uh, uh, the former Soviet Union and China. Uh, and then, uh, of course, with the working of neoliberalism, the working class movement has been weakened in the industrial capitalist countries, you see? So um, you have four decades of abuse by the imperialists. But you will see now, as a result of their own greed, extreme and unbridled greed, they themselves are fighting over uh, you know, fields of investments, sources of uh, cheap raw materials, and um, and uh, sources of cheap labor. They're fighting. Look at the U.S. Uh, and China, which used to be close partners in the so-called neoliberal globalization. They're fighting. No, so uh, that is a that is a big indication of the uh, crisis. How bad the crisis of uh, overproduction is. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, among the people, there is a shrinkage of the middle class. And they have joined what they call the precariat, no? Uh, you know, they're subjected to, you know, McDonald's, you know, having uh, temporary part time jobs, McDonald's jobs, and also the workers. Uh, you know, job security, wages, those are no longer secured. Uh, just to have, you know, uh, sufficient. Uh, health insurance or having simply health insurance, uh, that, is, uh, that is something uh, that uh, most workers uh, have. And in the uh, uh, leading imperialist country, the United States, you know, 40% of the people do not have more than $400 in their wallet. That's uh, how, bad, uh, how bad is the inequality and the, um, uh, how bad is the state of the income of the people. Now, um, why are the teachings of Lenin on party building relevant? Uh, you know, there are those under the influence, mainly petty bourgeois, uh, being manipulated by, uh, by the big bourgeoisie, uh, say, oh, we don't need any, uh, any party uh, to be able to make protest and make demands. No. Um, right now, so, you know, there have been movements before, like uh, you have the Occupy movement, and uh, up to now, you have the Indigenous Yellow vest. And so on. So you have these uh, uh, apparently spontaneous movements, because there is no party uh, that has the revolutionary aim of uh, disposing of, replacing the capitalist system with the socialist system. So there must be a party that uh, must be built, uh, in the correct way, ideologically, politically, and organizational. That means to say, it must be clear, what is the theoretical guide? It is Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. And uh, in every country, according to the conditions, what is the, the general political line in order to be able to arouse, organize, and mobilize the people? And then, of course, uh, organizationally, the party must be guided 
by the principle of democratic centralism. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, concentrating the ideas, demands, and the wishes of the people through decisions by the proper leading organs. And so uh, the decisions are made on the basis of democracy. Uh, you know, from the people, uh, you deliver to the people, but you learn from them. And uh, among uh, cadres uh, in leading organs, the majority rule is followed after discussion of, uh, of the facts and the issues. And those, uh, you know, because Marxist Leninists are scientific, no? Uh, you know, uh, certain decisions may be valid only uh, within a certain scale. Upon the entry of new facts and new developments, you can always amend the, or to, you can always adopt a new policy, but uh, you always use the democratic process. So within that party, there is both a freedom and discipline. Uh, there is discipline because you have to follow the democratic rule that uh, the majority decision must be followed while it is not yet being changed. So uh, that's how democratic um, a communist party is while it is at the same time centralist in the sense of being able to concentrate uh, the ideas, uh, the facts and uh, wishes uh, and needs of the, the people uh, as uh, reflected in uh, uh, representations made by the cadres and the leading organs. Okay, so we've, so now we've heard about why or how the party is such an important part of a revolution, um, but maybe the other the other side of it or the other way around. Why is it that purely trade union struggle means um, to quote the ideological enslavement of the workers by the bourgeoisie? Why is it harmful for the advancement of the revolution? As I, as I said earlier, um, the um, the trade unions and their struggle, their trade union struggle, are focused on economic demands. Uh, they are focused on uh, getting better wages uh, and uh, less working hours. Uh, so uh, that's an important uh, thing to do. Uh, that's an important focus. And uh, it's an important task to um, pursue uh, the uh, trade union struggle. Um, but uh, uh, it is not enough uh, to be preoccupied with it and uh, exclude the necessity of uh, forming the Revolutionary Party of the Proletariat, uh, which serves as the vanguard party of the working class with the uh, ultimate aim of uh, replacing uh, the bourgeoisie. The, class dictatorship of the bourgeoisie must be replaced by the socialist state. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we were also um, talking about the spontaneous movement. So the greater the spontaneous upsurge of the masses and the more widespread the movement, the more rapid the demand is for greater consciousness in the theoretical, political, and organizational work. Can you share us um, some experiences on how to make sure that the masses' dissatisfaction does not end up in only spontaneous struggles? You are correct in observing that uh, as spontaneous mass struggles arise and um, uh, surge forward, there is uh, a greater need for uh, consolidating them for having a leadership, a party leadership, or a party that can lead them and uh, make them more effective. Because, you know, uh, spontaneous mass struggles can easily dissipate after some time when they don't get results, or they, are, um, they may be appeased sometimes by small concessions, or uh, they can be derailed. No? The mass uh, spontaneous struggles can be uh, led astray by uh, the bourgeoisie or by the agents of the bourgeoisie. So it's necessary to have the uh, revolutionary of the proletariat 
to be existing and at work. And this is how the this is the, how the Vanguard Party works. You know? So you have a party that um, um, that tries to understand theoretically what are the problems. Uh, they have the they have to study comprehensively and profoundly the problems of society, not only in one country but in the whole capitalist world. So what does that mean? Um, communists, as uh, members of the Vanguard Party, uh, study philosophy, um, political economy, and social science. So those are the key terms uh, started by uh, Marx, and then uh, the content would develop uh, from uh, one period to another in the development of the uh, theory, the revolutionary theory of the proletariat. You see, it's important to have the correct uh, uh, philosophy because you know, um, you know, the, the ruling class uh, likes to mislead the people with notions that they nothing can be done eh, about their problems because uh, things are designed by God, no? And if you want any change, you pray, eh? <laughs> and you probably can get some small change. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, it, and then, uh, in modern times, there are those uh, who will uh, uh, propose a third view, huh? uh, a subjective, a sub subjectivist viewpoint, where uh, you don't, uh, you you have problems because it is your personal problems. You don't know how to use the opportunities within the system. The system gives you all the chances, but you know people differ and so on. So they, you know, they cover up the reality yeah. of class exploitation. So that's and then uh, uh, so it's important to have philosophy, to have the materialist scientific outlook, and philosophy provides you the method of cognition, analysis, and doing things. So that's what philosophy gives, you know. Now, um, and the party also, uh, you know, uh, what I say, you may say, uh, what I have just said, you might say, is all highfalutin, no? Highfalutin. What does it have something? Uh, what does it have to do with the realities concrete in the here and now, no? Of course, the Marxists will not uh, dogmatically just, you know. Uh, boast about his theory. He has to study the situation, the history and his, and concrete circumstances of a society. Then he can formulate the program or the general political line by which to arouse, organize, and mobilize the people for revolution. So uh, that's important. The political building, you build uh, mass organizations, you build more trade unions and more uh, different types of uh, uh, mass organizations uh, so that uh, there is consolidation among the masses. And these mass organizations uh, coordinate with the party. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the most important uh, mass organization would be the People's Army when it's, it's possible to build it uh, in order to fight uh, the class enemy. Because ultimately, you have to confront, uh, you have to confront the class dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And it is an organization of violence, mm -hmm. as I explained earlier. Um, and uh, uh, the People's Army uh, becomes the main component of a new state power that can be developed. Uh, in the underdeveloped countries, in like the Philippines, as in China before, there is the advantage that even while the ruling class is still seated in the cities, um, the revolutionaries can form um, the people's government in the countryside because they have an army to back up uh, the uh, project, the enterprise of uh, building uh, the people's government. So. And then, well, so much for what can be done politically. And uh, by doing things politically, you build the political forces. Uh, that means to say, in very simple terms, you have the mass organizations led by the party, and you have a high level of consciousness, even among the entirety of the masses, including the unorganized ones. 
Uh, through propaganda and agitation, your ideas spread rapidly, and through your effective mass actions, you, uh, the, the, uh, the message gets around more quickly. And um, of course, uh, the party must be able to build itself organizationally. It must become, as in the Philippines, huh? it's, uh, we started with just uh, a few people in trying to reestablish the old party, which went bankrupt. No, uh, the, We had to establish a new, <coughs> a new revolutionary party with the proletariat. And uh, our starting point was to learn theory. And we had the advantage of learning from the successful big, uh, experiences of the Soviet Union and China and other Vietnam and other countries. And uh, of course, uh, we had to relate to the history and circumstances of the Philippines. Okay, we um, proposed the um, bourgeois democratic revolution of the new type, new type because led by the proletariat. And then uh, we were serious enough. Uh, to build uh, mass organizations that went nationwide, and this would become the basis of uh, developing the party also nationwide. The youth was a key, played a key role in this regard. Kabatang Makabayan played the key role. Uh, with uh, Kabatang Makabayan spreading even faster than the uh, trade union movement, uh, which I also joined, the uh, Lapiang Mangagawa and uh, um, and the, the, the big uh, labor federations then, um, the uh, KM um, was spread faster, uh, you know, in the Philippines, in, as in any underdeveloped country, even before neoliberalism, only about 10% of the workers are organized through the U trade union movement. So you really have to do, you really have to launch political mm -hmm. mass actions to engage more people. And the youth uh, is a special assistant, a very affix, uh, effective kind of assistant to the working class. So KM described itself as the, um, as the assistant of the working class and the training school for cadres. Uh, so now, um, and then uh, from the mass movement and the mass organizations, you get the advanced mass activists. And so you enroll them into the party, if they agree. No? If you're, and it, that, that takes, uh, it is the responsibility of the party caterers and members to recruit uh, um, uh, fellows, co comrades from uh, the mass organizations. So you were, um, so we're talking about uh, mass organizations, mass actions, um, the youth, you know, and then the workers, but how do we, so can you share maybe experiences? Like how do you make sure that the workers are agitated beyond their exposure to their factory conditions, beyond their the exploitation in their workplace? How do you develop that economic agitation into further political agitation? Or how do you combine these forces? In developing the mass movement among the workers or other sectors of society, um, the key terms are AOM, no? Arouse, organize, and mobilize. Now, if you are a communist cater uh, and member because of your theoretical uh, knowledge and uh, your uh, supposed uh, mastery of the program, political program of the party, you know, uh, comprehensively and profoundly, what is the nature of Philippine society, what are the problems, and what is the solution, okay? So um, now, it, it is not enough to have the, you know, knowledge in store in your head or in the, you know, reading from the uh, party publications, that's not enough. You do, you have to do, social investigation and class analysis. You have to go to the workers to know their conditions. Uh, you know, the workers will not listen if, uh, you know, you mm -hmm. talk uh, generalities without any relevance to the particularities of their lives, you know? You have to go to them in order to do social investigation and make an and apply class analysis on the information that you get. And um, as Mao uh, has uh, taught us, it's necessary, you know, to move 
to keep on increasing your no level of knowledge by um, <clears throat> through the interaction of uh, theory and practice. No, you uh, your uh, understanding, previous understanding of the theory can even be sharpened because you get more information. So it is the scientific method of uh, learning. Now, if you know the conditions, the needs and demands of the people, of the workers in particular, then you can engage in propaganda and agitation effectively. Your pop agit will make sense, okay? Uh, propaganda means written propaganda. propaganda agit makes is uh, includes, you know, uh, good speakers, good speaking, and then probably that also includes cultural performances and other ways of arousing the people. Arousing them also in, involves enlightening them. Um, then, if you have aroused the workers, you can proceed to organize them. What is the sense in, uh, you know, uh, in trying to arouse the workers if you don't uh, organize them? And um, of course, trade unions must be established where uh, there are no trade unions yet. Uh, in the Philippines, it's always an open field uh, to organize workers because there are so many workers not yet organized. And then if uh, trade unions already exist, good. If they are led by, by uh, progressive trade union leaders, well, if they are not, then you have to build, uh, you have to, to uh, probably build another uh, trade union or uh, you can... Um, try to uh, um, change, huh? mutate the existing trade union. If, uh, if, if it's led by uh, a corrupt leader, but you have certain members there by which you can change the character of the union, you can throw out the corrupt leadership and the union becomes a good organization. At the same time, it's not enough to organize the trade unions. You have to organize the party within the trade union. And then, um, so uh, we are already talking about organizing no? trade unions and even the party. So uh, the, um, when you, you achieve a high degree of organization, the more effective you become in mobilizing the people, the organized masses as well as the unorganized one. So your capacity to mobilize the masses keeps on increasing, especially if the organized part becomes larger then it reach, then they reach more of the unorganized and the all organized eventually become organized. So that's the uh, AOM uh, <laughs> formula of the mass movement. So um, and this AOM formula, how do we um, how do we organize or how do we do this uh, at these times? So how do we organize the masses and our ranks? These days, in the time of the pandemic, um, we can't physically gather because of uh, the quarantine and the lockdowns. Um, so maybe in general, but also maybe specific to yet, if you have any ideas um, about Anakbayan or how do we, yeah, how do we do it? Uh, the pandemic is temporary in relation to the long struggle. But during the pandemic, we must be able to do certain things. Uh, in order to organize or to prepare for bigger organize, organizing. Uh, but uh, even while, uh, while uh, you know, there is the pandemic, it is possible to organize um, mass actions by which to get more people. Um, you, have to, you have to take advantage of uh, uh, the high-tech kind of communication. You have the internet, no? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we used to have only the telephone, no? now we have the internet and uh, the social media especially. So people can communicate, people can agree what to do. Uh, one thing you can do is to conduct seminars like webinars. Like this like one. This. <laughs> That's it. this is uh, an educational thing, but it is also an organizational thing because you try to uh, reach more people to join to participate, no, that's organizing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, education and organization uh, come together. And 
it's possible to hold noise barrages, especially where uh, the issues are Philippine, then where there is a community contiguous among Filipinos, then it's easier, you know. <clears throat> the sounds, you can make the sounds and uh, a whole area uh, would be, uh, uh, would be uh, loud with the demands. And if uh, there are uh, other people in the community, in the, in the neighborhood, you ask them, you explain what are the issues. And, uh, but anyway, um, in the Philippines, uh, the mass organizations are doing a lot of work uh, in order to carry out uh, noise barrages. And um, by keeping up this mass protest, even under conditions of uh, lockdown and uh, people being divided then and locked up in their uh, uh, particular houses, <clears throat> um, you know, the the people are very mad with uh, the stupidity of the Duterte regime. You know, it it got to know uh, early, quite early. As a matter of fact, the first uh, the first one abroad outside of China to get sick. Um, would be in the Philippines, a visiting um, a Chinese couple, and uh, so so the, and then there were, there were warnings from the WHO, uh, like uh, Trump uh, Duterte made fun. Oh, this will uh, blow over. This will pass. You know, <laughs> Trump even uh, like Trump saying it's a hoax. No, mm. so Duterte did not make any preparations. No plan. Then uh, when uh, field reports showed that many were getting sick uh, belatedly, he uh, decided uh, to do the, the what they call the enhanced uh, uh, quarantine, community quarantine, or in other words, the lockdown. Sorry. <clears throat> and uh, uh, promises were made. Huh? So people uh, will be mass tested, uh, because people don't do not work and do not get income, uh, then they will get food and economic assistance, um, and so on and so forth. Promises were made. These promises remained unfulfilled. Duterte and uh, Duterte did not provide the medical solution. So military solution has been the overriding concern of Duterte because he wanted his uh, wish. Um, COVID-19 to serve as an excuse for him to uh, strength, to, to realize his dream of fascist dictatorship. And uh, he got immediately uh, emergency powers and you know, the authority to use uh, more than 375 billion pesos. And even he got the license to realign the uh, budget for the year 2020. So uh, what uh, Duterte has been specializing is to increase his uh, military hold, and he has been encouraging the troops to shoot dead anyone who did not follow, who do, uh, anyone who doesn't follow the quarantine rules. And so his uh, main concern is to grab more power and to grab more money, more public to steal um, together with all his uh, military and <clears throat> uh, bureaucratic agents, and uh, they have been stealing a lot of public money to, you know, through made up contracts, overpriced uh, uh, purchases. And uh, uh, the tragedy is that uh, they have been inadequate uh, protective gear uh, for uh, the, med the health workers. So many of them have been dying, infected. And then no mass testing, practically not even 1% uh, of the population. And uh, those who get sick, they don't get the bed space, they don't have, they don't get the medicine. So uh, the um, medical solution is, comp is practically out of the question for Duterte. His main concern has been uh, to use the COVID-19 as, as, as an excuse. Uh, to justify uh, martial law nationwide, de facto now he wants to formalize that 
and he wants to uh, realize a full fascist dictatorship in the Philippines. So, so people now are fed up. And you know, there are dramatic incidents where people are, uh, are shown to be oppressed, no? So uh, people uh, uh, found in the streets by the military or police are bullied or even uh, shot to, uh, uh, and even killed. And then, uh, of course, people are deprived of information. Uh, their right to information is, uh, is uh, uh, done away with if you, let's say, if you close down a big uh, station like ABS-CBN, no? So, uh, you know, you have heaps and heaps of abuse uh, suffered by the people. And it's important for uh, the movement, the, the patriotic and progressive movement to keep on uh, uh, agitating the people and in effect organizing them for uh, what are now possible mass actions and for future mass actions that can even bring down this uh, uh, despotic regime. So um, exactly. So we were talking. We we're talking about these things that are happening now. A lot of people are um, are angry at at the what's going on as well, economically um, in the Philippines. Definitely with with the lot. Um, with ABS-CBN, with the inefficiency of the government, etc. So how do, um, so first of like, how do we make sure that this temp, this frustration that people have now can be channeled to, um, to organize, um, like to be more, how do you say it, to, um, to continue? Even after this pandemic, how do we make sure that these people, their frustration right now can be channeled into productivity um, in this sense? And how do we navigate ourselves through these through spontaneous groups um, coming out these days, um, especially among young people like on social media um, who are clearly frustrated in the system? Well, uh, a higher level of consciousness uh, should be achieved through uh, uh, the social media and through webinars and other forms of uh, uh, intercommunity communications. You know, uh, the police and military are not enough to guard every community. It is possible still for small meetings to be held, no? Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's unstoppable is communications through uh, the internet, no? So, you know, in uh, information material gets distributed, slogans, memes, you know, uh, graphics, you know, artistic works can spread through the bus media. So the level of consciousness is raised. And um, there should be an attempt to, you know, uh, to organize at the same time. You know, you can organize, um, uh, you can invite one by one your classmates, your uh, friends, your relatives, your neighbors, and then uh, talk to them about the necessity of building an organization. Uh, perhaps if some, if, if uh, other people have their own organizations, you can engage them to join the movement against tyranny. So there's a united front organization. Or if they are unorganized, they're not in any form of organization, uh, you have to uh, uh, invite them according to their interest. Um, what type of organization to join? If they are students, uh, uh, the, the student organization should be um, a good uh, choice for them. If they are workers, they have to uh, be encouraged to join uh, the existing trade union or to form a new one. You you can have uh, organizational um, work done even under these conditions. Uh, so uh, as a result, um, after the COVID-19 crisis, the revolutionary party of the proletariat and the mass organizations and the broad United Front will become more ready uh, to confront the regime and remove it from power. 
like Marcos was removed from power. So uh, the, um, the patriotic and progressive forces can come out of this crisis stronger because the people are angry. Uh, these organized forces collect and uh, uh, put together the, the uh, um, what you call the discontent of the people and the people are more willing to get organized during the COVID-19 crisis and afterwards. Uh, you know, uh, the flow of political events can become very rapid. You know, when Marcos was overthrown, there were many people who got organized only some months, some weeks before uh, the uh, fateful days you know, of Marcos in February, uh, 1986. So, uh, you know, after um, a sufficient amount of information and enlightenment, uh, any person of good sense uh, will be willing to get organized to make himself more effective in collective action. Can probably yes. to the next yeah. Question. Sorry. Um, so, um, what if we practice um, criticism and self-criticism within the organization? Then, what is the problem of having freedom of criticism? There is no problem with the freedom of criticism uh, in uh, society at large. People in a socialist society or in the kind of society that we wish, which is socialism, um, there are democratic rights, including the right to, of expression and assembly among the people. And within, within the Revolutionary Party of the Proletariat, as well as in the mass organizations led by, by the Revolutionary Party, there is both freedom and discipline. Uh, that means to say, you know, as I pointed out earlier, democratic centralism is based on democracy. And um, <clears throat> uh, it's majority rule deciding from one level of the organization uh, to another level, to a higher level. Uh, and you know, uh, all the original uh, 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 information and ideas come from the bottom, from, uh, from the people as a result of uh, social uh, investigation and analysis and prompt attention to the current flow of events. So everything comes uh, from the people in the process of decision-making, okay? Uh, <clears throat> now, but of course, in the history of Russia, there are those who use the expression freedom of criticism in order to justify factionalism. Factionalism um, and uh, those who complain of over-centralism at the expense of democracy. Uh, you know, there is a combination, a dialectical relationship of uh, freedom and uh, discipline. And how do you uh, resolve that contradiction? Uh, decisions are taken by majority vote. Now, when a decision is taken, uh, those in the minority can reserve their opinion because, you know, uh, new facts and new developments might prove them right. Lenin was sometimes uh, in the minority, but, uh, you know, he did not break with the party uh, just because he was in the minority. Uh, he, um, you know, the, as... Uh, a scientific kind of organization, uh, the uh, revolutionary part of the proletariat is always ready uh, for to, uh, to receive new information and to look at new developments, whether they um, uh, confirm the correctness of a, an earlier decision. So um, you can reserve if you are in the minority, uh, you reserve your opinion, but as a matter of discipline, you must follow the decision and even join in implementation so you don't become an obstacle to the organization. So um, in, the, in, in general terms, 
that's the way how you uh, uh, maintain your own opinion, but you are always ready to have uh, a new decision taken uh, because it is your honest belief that with uh, uh, with certain facts and certain uh, uh, arguments coming in the future and new developments, uh, you you might be proven correctly. Uh, Lenin was not always uh, in the majority. See, so that's a clear demonstration of how you can exist democratically in a, in a revolutionary party of the proletariat. So, um, should newspapers like I, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, like Rabocheye Delo, or how do you how do, um, uh, should newspapers like that that input counter revolutionary ideas still have the right um, to freedom? of or to press freedom and what is the best way or what are the best ways to counter black propaganda well Rabuteri Delo originally was supposed to be uh, the publication of the amends uh, of the uh, organization set up by Lenin in uh, 1895 and then in by 1898 uh, the economist so-called you know, uh, came up and they insisted on the idea that uh, the struggle must be strictly economic in character. They had, uh, they, they did not like uh, political struggle, especially revolutionary political struggle. So uh, they, they were advocating economism. Of course, you may describe this as a reactionary idea, you know, the refusal to accept to recognize the necessity of uh, a revolutionary political struggle, limiting the struggle uh, to confinement no? uh, within the bourgeois system. Because you are, if you're only for, uh, for uh, economic struggle, you're only in for you know, crumbs coming from the ruling class, from the capitalist class. And uh, um, so, uh, uh, you become a hindrance to the revolutionary struggle. Now, you may resort to organizational methods, then uh, the, uh, that, that certainly is not appreciated by those who are loyal to the party. So, uh, but you know, before there is any kind of uh, organizational acts of discipline uh, imposed on people who have uh, wrong ideas, the point is to explain what is the correct line. Um, explain the correct line, be patient, persuasive. Uh, as Mao said, do not be rough, bureaucratic and dogmatic. Uh, you don't say that uh, you have, the, you have uh, the correct term and uh, all that you need to do is to impose it. No, you have to do a lot of explaining. Because the point is, in debating with people with wrong ideas, um, their followers also listen. And maybe some of those who propose the wrong ideas can be convinced. No? So it's important to do uh, democratic persuasion. That's the democratic part of, uh, of being in the same revolutionary organization. Um, being counter-revolutionary uh, counter could mean, you know, doing some organizational acts um, uh, against the party. Uh, well, uh, that can be the subject of uh, disciplinary action. But so long as the debate, the contest is ideological, keep it ideological. Uh, you have to defeat the, your opponent uh, in, in terms of ideas and on the basis of uh, facts. Yes. So um, why don't uh, the revolutionaries direct um, their forces towards parliament parliamentary struggle and push major reforms instead of waging an armed one? Well, uh, Marx and Engels and the Communist, Part the Communist Manifesto said a long time ago that um, the, the dictatorship, the class dictatorship of the bourgeoisie must be uh, overthrown by 
the di class dictatorship of the proletariat if there must be socialism. Okay. And, uh, but Marx also said uh, that um, in order to win the struggle for socialism, you must also win the battle for democracy. You know what, uh, in a capitalist society, the ruling class is so strong that he would use his, organized for, uh, organ his organization of violence called the state or class dictatorship uh, to suppress those advocating socialism. And uh, that state, the ruling class and its state would even unleash a fascist movement. So you really have to win the battle for democracy. Uh, and not only, you know, in talking in, uh, in the parliament, uh, having representatives there and uh, uh, having uh, a debate uh, uh, with opponents in the, in the parliament, but uh, uh, you have to be able to arouse, organize and mobilize the masses so that the masses are on your side, uh, not only um, in the course of parliamentary struggle, but in the course of uh, um, revolutionary armed struggle, if the conditions arise for such. So uh, limiting oneself to parliamentary struggle would be what is called revisionism. It means mm -hmm. to say, uh, in the first place, you limit yourself uh, just to, you know, being within the bourgeois uh, system of rule and, you know, begging for reforms. Uh, reforms are not bad. And what is bad is if you, all that you do is begging for reforms, you, you, you become a reformist in that way. But, you know, certain reforms can be demanded and uh, to some extent uh, even realized. But uh, uh, the main thing is that these are the, the bridge uh, to a higher level of understanding and action towards the revolutionary change of the whole system. Uh, I mean to say the replacement, uh, you know, system change is the objective. Um, uh, you know, in the experience of, uh, of Russia, you know, after the 1905 revolution, uh, the Tsarism, the Tsarist, uh, the Tsar was trying to, um, was trying to uh, make limited reforms. Yeah, Duma, the parliament was set up. Uh, and at the same time, he was still using repressive measures. So he was using the combination of both in order to squeeze the proletarian revolutionaries. But you know, instead of uh, allowing themselves just to be squeezed, uh, the Bolsheviks, Lenin and the Bolsheviks made use of uh, uh, the space for parliamentary struggle. So there were times when the Bolsheviks were in the Duma. No, Then, of course, it was in the nature of uh, the Tsarist rule uh, to, be, um, um, to be fundamentally and violently against the, the Bolsheviks. So it, the time would, be, would come when the Tsar himself uh, when the Tsar could not satisfy even the the the, the, the Mensheviks, uh, the softer sort, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of social democrats, and so it would come to pass that uh, uh, the parliamentary struggle has been a vehicle for the Bolsheviks to uh, arouse, organize, and mobilize the people. Um, it uh, facilitated. Uh, their political work. Uh, to that extent, um, uh, parliamentary uh, struggle is, uh, uh, is useful. Now, to absolutely throw away opportunities for parliamentary struggle <coughs> would be what, is, what Lenin called infantile communist disorder. Huh? Uh, you are dogmatic, all that you know is, you know, probably uh, talk about armed revolution, possibly even without doing about it. You know, those who mm. love to talk about uh, exclusive uh, uh, focus on, uh, on armed struggle are oftentimes those who do not have any interest in, in making it anyway. So <laughs> uh, uh, all forms of struggle must be availed of so long as they are possible. But the, but the point is in every form of struggle is to get uh, 
Dama says to participate in the in your movement. So um, without uh, without using parliamentary uh, struggle and other forms of legal struggle, you are you are giving up. Uh, you are you would be giving up opportunities for reaching people. You you engage in the United Front even you may you have a United Front even with you know uh, you know. Uh, characters and forces that do not qualify to become party members, you know. Uh, but the point is, uh, you uh, widen the space for the revolutionaries. Uh, you know, it goes this way. I'll give you a very, uh, very concrete example. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't uh, disdain taking the plane. Eh, to go to the Philippines just because the plane company is owned by the dirty capitalists. Mm -hmm. No, you pay anyway for your fare. You use the plane to get to the Philippines quick. <laughs> In other words, uh, it would be dogmatic to, to say, I better swim the oceans rather than take uh, a, a plane that, that is owned by the class enemy. No? Mm -hmm. uh, remember, Lenin was able to go back to, to Russia on a train, sealed train, uh, through Germany from Switzerland. <laughs> All right, yes. I like that analogy. So the Philippines is the, um, is the revolutionary, are the revolutionary masses. Um, so regarding the NDF and um, the Philippines, um, what is it, or... Um, you know, they already have their foot, a foothold on certain units and people are armed. There is armed struggle. Um, what is stopping them from going full offensive in order to take over the current state? When there is already armed struggle going on and there are um, forces, revolutionary forces, that uh, wish the armed overthrow of the reactionary state, you have to look at the balance of forces every time. When you force still very much inferior to the armed force of your enemy, it would be suicide eh, to sally forth into the cities and uh, get crushed there. No, that's the you're moving into uh, the territory of your enemy uh, without sufficient force. No, mm -hmm. so uh, thanks to Mao. There is this. There is the strategic line of protracted people's war. You go through stages. Um, first, uh, strategic defensive because the enemy is strong, uh, and you are small, and so it's your enemy uh, that is on the strategic um, uh, uh, offensive. Now you apply dialectical materialism in armed struggle. Uh, the enemy seems to be so big and indivisibly strong. But you know, when you are in the countryside, that big enemy force is really small for the entire archipelago. And then it has to divide its strength. When, it, uh, when your enemy fields its uh, armed units, they are divided by the terrain and they are divided by the, by the um, refusal of the people to tell where the MPA is, no? So, uh, what, the, what the small and weak MPA do is to pick out every soft spot, every soft unit, eh? uh, every soft part of that uh, big machinery and the NPA in the process of uh, succeeding in tactical offensives accumulate weapons, no? Then the time will come when the NPA shall have gained so much strength as to be able to move into the strategic equilibrium or stalemate. Uh, that stage involves, you know, a cease of battle over certain areas, but of course, there are rear bases already. Eh? There are rear uh, revolutionary uh, base areas as rear for the People's Army. So, but you have a period of a cease over large areas. Then you keep the enemy beating with your regular mobile forces, no longer just guerrilla forces. It is regular mobile forces capable of eating up parts, big, big, bigger and bigger parts of your opponent. And there is a backup uh, by the guerrilla forces and the people's militia. So 
your regular mobile forces uh, will eat up the strength of the enemy and uh, in the course of time and even it's it uh, it is supposed to be shorter than this uh, long long uh, uh, strategic defensive then afterwards uh, the enemy um, Man, so many enemy units are destroyed, it becomes weak. It has tendencies of disintegrating. The ruling class gets split up. Uh, uh, they blame each other, you know, factions of the same ruling class would blame each other for the deterioration of the situation and the condition of their uh, system. So uh, that will be the time for uh, the People's Army, as China, as in China, uh, the revolutionary forces would encircle, uh, would tighten the encirclement of the cities and then ask the enemy forces to surrender or else uh, they will have a, 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 a battle, a big battle they cannot win. No? Uh, you know, the big cities of Shanghai uh, and so on in China were surrendered by, uh, by the commanding generals of Chiang Kai-shek because uh, the People's Army had already become so strong. So there is a process of development through the protracted People's War. That is the beauty of it, no? Um, you know, you don't uh, gamble whatever, what little thing, what little strength you have, you don't gamble it right away and get crushed, no? Um, so, and you know, the uh, this uh, stupid uh, elements of the enemy say, oh, after uh, more than 50 years, you don't have, you have not yet seized Malacanang Palace. No, they're stupid. There is now in the Philippines what Lenin called a situation of dual political power. There are two governments. One is the one government is in Manila and other urban urban areas. It's a government of the big corporations and landlords, subordinate to uh, imperialist powers. But in the countryside, you have a people's government of workers and peasants. That was the case. Uh, in this, in Russia, it was the case while the Kerensky government was still existing, and the the most of the Soviets were already exercising power mm -hmm. under the leadership of the Bolsheviks. So two cover, uh, uh, two governments exist, and in uh, China that was also the case, while uh, the Kuomintang was based somewhere, no, um, let's say Nanjing, or you have the People's Government at one time in Chinkansan and then ultimately in Yenan. So two governments exist. Uh, that is what is meant by dual power. And that is the one existing now. So, uh, you know, the revolutionary movement in the Philippines started with only nine rifles. Now the NPA is thousands and it has so it is supporting a people's government. So they, they, don't just, they, they shouldn't just dismiss the revolutionary movement as a big failure for not being able to seize Malacanang Palace. There will be time for that. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so that was the last question of our Q&A portion. Is there anything you would like to add before we take a short break? Well, I think uh, we have uh, discussed so many important questions. Uh, I think um, uh, that from my viewpoint that would be enough okay then we would um we take can a short... wait for other questions from the audience probably exactly exactly so we would take a short music break and then um the floor will or the floor will be opened for questions A motion picture by Stanislas Rostovsky. At dawn, it's quiet here. Young girls are the heroines of this picture, which tells of their first loves, of the happy days of youth, their dreams that were never to come true. Because in the land they loved, the Second World War had come with all its terror. 
of suspense, the terrible suspense of commando warfare. The story of the noble sacrifice of all these girls who were never to return. great picture that you must see. Okay, so um, we are now back um, with Tito Joe. So um, I have one question from Anonymous. Um, in Europe, trade union is an integral part of the workers' life, meaning they are even required or encouraged to be part of the trade union. Some even see it as a day job that is that more like a day job than a struggle itself or a necessity. How do you think we can radicalize or organize the OFWs to streamline the trade union struggle to the struggle of the entire Filipino people? While they are abroad, the overseas Filipino workers can learn from uh, the trade union struggle in the countries where they are, say in Europe or the US. Um, but let's focus on Europe. Uh, you know that uh, our workers um, are usually in a so-called tripartite uh, arrangement called the social uh, accord. That is a product of the anti-fascist struggle and uh, that was uh, popularized uh, after World War II. So the ruling class is very confident in having such a social accord in some, in some countries. Uh, workers are even represented in some boards of uh, companies. So it goes that far, no? Um, but you know, in a tripartite social accord, the um, 
um, the state representatives and the bourgeois representatives put the workers in a corner. So, and they have the, um, the ruling class has the confidence of having this accord because first they have, uh, for, a some con for a certain period of time, they've developed what you might call a labor aristocracy, a pliable, a pliable kind of trade union movement that probably led by Christian Democrats and by right-wing socialists, no? So, and uh, also by some liberals, no? Uh, so the, the ruling class is very confident, no? It is uh, getting a lot of uh, bacon from abroad, no? From the from the from the former colonies and from the world market, they can afford. Uh, but does, it does not mean that you uh, uh, cannot you cannot get anything positive from this uh, sort of thing. As a matter of fact, um, uh, because of this tripartite arrangement, uh, uh, certain progressive elements in the trade union movement also have a space. Sometimes, uh, you know. Uh, they, uh, depending on which which uh, progressive parties have, uh, uh, um, depending on how strong they are in the trade unions, there are certain countries where left-wing parties are strong in the trade union, union movement, and they even make accommodations and cooperation with overseas uh, contract workers. So Migrante has to cooperate with them. and. Uh, in the Netherlands, it's even possible for undocumented uh, workers uh, to keep on uh, working and uh, having some identification uh, with no um, uh, with no immediate threats to them from the authorities. And you know, uh, there is more to learn from the trade union struggle than uh, you know uh, how the social accord, the tripartite social accord uh, operates. <clears throat> but in terms of the backward conditions of the Philippines, uh, this sort of thing can be, um, shall we say, uh, adapted and suited to the demands for legal trade union organizing. Uh, you know, when you invoke, uh, let's say, uh, an example from Europe, and that uh, strengthens the legality of your idea, in the Philippines, that's important, no? And um, so, uh, and in a sense, um, there may be times where you can actually co cooperate with the bourgeoisie because it's a national in character and it's against an imperialist. There's something peculiar to the Philippine situation. I've known, I have friends among the national bourgeois. And so uh, in such instances, they are uh, more friendly to the trade unions than, you know, this uh, uh, bourgeois, this comprador bourgeois that relies on uh, on their connections with uh, the big mo foreign monopoly firms. No? So, you know, uh, now while Filipinos are abroad, they must, of course, get in touch with their, uh, with their compatriots in the Philippines. That's why, you know, I think uh, Migrante has branches all over the world, but it is a center uh, in the Philippines. And so um, ideas and practices that can be learned abroad can be, uh, can, can be communicated also. Uh, wh while they are abroad, uh, they can uh, transmit those ideas. And you know, solidarity relations are developed, are always developing. So uh, there is a direct um, relationship between uh, trade unions in Europe and trade unions in the Philippines. So learning from each other is important. Uh, even if, let's say, workers uh, belong to, uh, let's say, trade unions that you might say uh, out of our standard, out of the standard of the proletarian revolutionaries. But you know, Lenin pointed out the importance of working even within reactionary unions, see? Um, because um, that's the way of uh, increasing, expanding the influence and strength of the, what you might call the real trade union movement. So uh, uh, the proletarian revolutionaries 
should not miss the opportunity of working even and cooperating even with reactionary trade unions, provided uh, uh, you keep to your uh, principles and uh, uh, you work for the common good. No, uh, and, you know if we get if the revolutionary movement can relate to churches, why not uh, more secular entities like trade unions of varying uh, uh, amounts of distance from a real revolutionary trade union, no? Because the important thing is the work that has to be found there. And they are, uh, they, they, sh they ought to be reached by the AOM <laughs> of the real trade union movement. <laughs> so we have um, another question from Phoenix. Will there be an instance of conflict between party and the masses? Party, for instance, having a theoretic, anal analytic, scientific lens, for example, in economic planning or crisis management, and masses, the majority, wanting a different course of action. How do we resolve this while also being efficient, for example, in a crisis? Well, applying dialectical materialism, party and masses are two distinct entities. And uh, the party tries hard to serve the people, the masses, okay? And, um, but then, uh, you know, there can be differences of opinions within a party, how best to serve, uh, you know, uh, even that which is not effective uh, in serving the people, some people in a party would, uh, we, we would insist it's the correct line, no? So, um, in other words, uh, the party as a, as a distinct uh, organism has its own laws, eh? has its own laws of motion. But a party uh, that is, uh, cannot be a party of the proletariat um, and a party that leads the people, if it doesn't know how to uh, reflect the needs, wishes, and demands of the people. So, um, you know, I would put the burden of learning from the masses uh, on the party. The party should not, uh, you know, be the arrogant know-it-all beforehand. No? Uh, the party must always be linked closely, intimately linked with the masses so that they know the conditions and demands of the masses. Uh, so, uh, recognition of the distinctness or difference between the two entities uh, should in, should should uh, impress on the party that it must always learn from the masses so that it will not become alienated or detached from it. Because you know a party can accumulate so much power uh, unto itself, and you know be, and be, it becomes. Uh, it becomes uh, dense and uh, blinded to the, to the needs of the masses. And a revolutionary party has no reason for existence and no chance of becoming strong enough to win power if it does not know how to uh, serve the people faithfully and uh, properly. So um, um, it, is, it is wrong to idealize Party and masses are the same thing. No, uh, the um, the masses consist of uh, uh, more more people than workers. They are the non proletarians. There are people who belong to, for instance, in the Philippines. You don't just have uh, uh, you don't just have industrial proletariat. It's even a minority in relation to the peasants. No. There are the, aside from the, the workers, there are the peasants in need of revolution. And also the uh, um, lower levels of the middle class, uh, uh, those who are now famously called precariat, no? <laughs> Joining the, uh, uh, those uh, previously deprived by the system. They, they want revolution. So um, the party must you know, understand the complex, uh, uh, reality, uh, certain classes different from the workers uh, exist, but they are they are linked, they're bound 
by the same uh, suffering and by the same struggle uh, against those who make them suffer oppression and exploitation. All right, um, and the follow up for also from Phoenix is, um, hold on. Speaking from personal experience, a mass organization can become too paranoid with regard to their members, especially new ones. Uh, is there a way to prevent this? Ah, in mass organization, like security, I think yeah. um, a party cater must understand that a mass organization uh, can attract all kinds of people. Uh, because, you know, the standards of membership are lower than in the party. In the party, it's more rigorous. There are the ideological, political, and organizational requirements. In the mass organization, you are more loose. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's entirely possible that even police agents can get in, no? But uh, you are not going to apply uh, in, search of, in search of possible enemy agents. You don't apply, you know, uh, severe police actions, no? Otherwise, uh, you, you will do a lot of mistakes, no? Because uh, anyway, the mass organizations, uh, if legal, have perfectly legal objectives. And um, <clears throat> if you are not sure uh, about, the, uh, about the real position of a member, all that you need is to do more uh, persuasive educational work on that such a person. Uh, I have seen, I know, in, in you know, as a teacher, uh, I am in a way engaged in dealing with the masses, you know, students with different kinds of views. Huh? I've had students uh, who, <clears throat> who are at the start very anti-communist, very, eh, very, uh, very much strongly against what I say in class. I let them, I let them speak up and debate with me. Then uh, I always feel happy when I persuade them. And many have become uh, militant activists uh, by going through this process of education. So um, the, uh, in mass work, you must be open-minded. You must be ready for all sorts of people. Don't prejudge people as enemy agents and people whom, whom you must exclude. Um, you must be judicious and keep in mind uh, what uh, is uh, to be done in order, in order to become more certain that someone is, and you must exert the effort to develop the, the person. Any, uh, any person uh, uh, with, uh, with some amount of intelligence will be open to, to reason. Uh, even an enemy agent can be turned around if uh, you, you know, if, if, you, if, if you, if you, because you know, a mass organization is anyway, not for combat, no? And uh, uh, they can, they can spy on you, but everything you do is legal. So what's the problem? Um, the, 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 there is bigger cost if you are over suspicious, no? And try to exclude people on mere suspicion or insufficient information. So you must give yourself the chance to, and to know more of the facts, then jump to conclusions and uh, uh, exclude uh, someone. You don't, in, um, you know, this is the problem is with some Maoists, which I call infantile Maoists. Uh, they, um, they think uh, they don't have to do mass work in a painstaking work. They think it's a matter of discovering ready-made Maoists. No, you don't find any ready-made Maoists. Uh, or ready-made revolutionaries. You have to do your mass work and then discover, discover those who are interested in the uh, in revolution. Discover them as you develop them. No, you don't just discover them. You develop them in the first place so that uh, you know that they are sincerely committed to the revolutionary struggle. And you know, uh, even uh, even you could before you consider a revolutionary struggle for anyone in 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 the mass movement, uh, you have the obligation to enlighten enlighten the member, 
so that it will probably it will take another person, a cadre, a member of the uh, revolutionary party of the proletariat who will do the um, who will do uh, the uh, elevation of the mass activist to uh, being a member of the revolutionary party. Uh, your business is to propagate and educate your members according to the prog legal uh, legal program of the mass organization. All right, um, thank you so much. So we have closed the floor. Um, thank you, Tito Joe, for um, enlightening us on this uh, on so many issues, topics today. Um, and also thank you to Ka Irina for joining us um, for this special edition and the culmination of our Lenin serie. Um, so this month, uh, May, we have had the, the 1st of May to celebrate the 1st of May, the International Workers' Day, as well as um, the birthday of Marx, Karl Marx. Um, we will be starting a new series, a new webinar series. Um, and the first topic will be wage, labor, and capital. Mm -hmm. The second will be value, price, and profit. And the third will be the Communist Manifesto. Mm -hmm. So uh, watch out for the announcements. Um, and I hope we'll see all of you then. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we just forgot to mention, um, we also have certificates um, for this ED, for this um, webinar series. Um, so just send us a private message or a comment and we can send you a certificate of uh, completion of completing this and yeah it's being projected now thank you again Oh, 
Para sa pagkakaisa, pagsulong na rito tayo Para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong na rito tayo Para ang kalat-kalat na mulo, magiging muod na buo Pagkakaisa, paglaban, pagumpay sa ating bayan sa daibigan paglaya ng sangkatauhan narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa pagsulong narito tayo para sa masangaping Pilipino narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo magiging muong Narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa, pagsulong, narito tayo para sa masang aping Pilipino, narito tayo.